Hello and welcome back to Quarantine Catch-Up. My name is Chris Famularo. Today I am joined by, of course, Tommy Rinaldi, and we have a very special guest today, my sister, Emily Famularo. Emily, how are you doing today? I'm good. It's very hot. How are you guys doing today? Also warm here, so it's, you know, it's June, so we're getting used to it. <laughs> yeah, it's right. about to be summer, but I'm doing well. I'm happy to have you here. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me this week. I'm so excited. I watch every week. And oh my God. A loyal my fan. Turn. My. A loyal fan. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much. And, you know, to just to reference all the past ones that you've brought up, you are our first graduate student that we have on. It's very exciting to, you know, kind of see how your schooling will differ from everybody else. Everybody else is an undergrad, little little undergrad that doesn't know what's going on. Still. Yeah. So you, you are currently in grad school at Emerson, that, which is in Boston, but you're living in Rhode Island at the time. So how is, you know, obviously this is called quarantine catch up. We're all still currently in quarantine because of COVID. How is that affecting, you know, your everyday life and how have you kind of been taking the changes? Definitely. I mean, like any college student, it has obviously affected the way that I am learning and receiving my education as a grad student. Oftentimes in college, grad students are like kind of pushed to the side anyway because there's a much larger undergrad population. So there's still a lot up in the air about that. But overall, quarantine has not been that bad for me, in all honesty. I've used it as a time to really like focus on my mental health and like physical well being. I've been walking every day. Um, it's also been really good for writing, which is always good because in real life, I feel like I never have <laughs> that opportunity to just sit down and write with, you know, time on my hands. Yeah, I'm sure. And I mean, you bring up a couple of interesting things there. I mean, the health aspect is definitely one that I think all of us have been focusing on. I mean, I've been going on bike rides every day and trying to focus on, you know, being outside more and, and just eating better. I know Tommy goes on bike rides, has been working out as eating schedule. So do you think that this, while it's really hard being at home all the time and not, you know, having a real routine, do you think trying to find a bit of a healthier lifestyle is, is harder or a bit easier during quarantine? It honestly feels a bit easier because, A, nowhere is open, so there's no temptation to be like, I want to go out tonight yeah. and, like, let's <laughs> exactly. drink every day of the weekend and all of that stuff. So I feel like it's easier to con not only control your food, but because of the time it's really easy to build your schedule around like exercise and being outside. So um, I also have been taking walks every day. I'm up to five miles a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> walking That's good for you. Because I'm like, let me just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no reason to stop. I got nothing right. else to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's one o'clock. I guess I'll just continue to walk. But <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, obviously, the other main thing is that you can fill your time is with just consuming all kinds of media. I mean, what have you what have you been watching? What have you been listening to? If you've been playing video games, we we want to hear it. What have you been doing? Yes. So I have been doing all of those things. It's funny because I feel like I want to do everything like read and write and video games and hang out with, you know, my roommates and all of that stuff. But we've been good. We've all been watching shows together. So we have watched in the last week, <laughs> Queer Eye season five. So good, per usual, very heartwarming. It takes place in Philadelphia. So it was like deja vu. Oh, very um, nice. Yeah. And then we just finished F is for Family, which was in its fourth season. Um, that's Bill Burr uh, animated special. It's really good. It takes place in the 70s. It hits on very interesting, relevant topics like racism and um, queerness and being in a family and unexpectedly having a baby and it was really, it was a hard season because I think the other seasons were a lot um, funnier, but it was, it was emotional, which I think is, is an interesting turn for the show to take. And then last week we finished The Great, which is on Hulu, and that is a com comedy drama highlighting Catherine the Great's rise to being one of Russia's longest and most important um, women 
czar zarinas <laughs> very cool yeah, I watched, um, I haven't watched the most recent Ethis for Family. I watched seasons one and two really fast. And then, like, I think I'm still only halfway through season three. So that's, like, when Bill, uh, when they have the new, like, war veteran neighbor comes home with his Vietnamese wife. And it's so uncomfortable and just, like, it's funny, but it's so, I guess, relevant for that kind of understanding of, of a relationship that, you know, as a neighbor, you kind of, feel like you should talk about but then you don't want to step over anybody's toes and i think ever ever for f is for family is good it's just i haven't really you know there's been other shows that i have caught up on but i would de- i would definitely recommend that show as well yeah, yeah i haven't no. i haven't watched it at all but i've been really interested in it because i love bill burr but it kind of sounds like what happened with big mouths i feel like the first two seasons were really funny and then the third season was very much focused on story and kind of developing a little bit more into it instead of focusing on the humor that you typically get. So that's really interesting to hear. Right. And I almost wonder too, if that's a very specific Netflix algorithm that these shows really kind of, they want to stay relevant to Netflix, which means that their first two seasons probably need to have more of that comedy aspect for Netflix to say like, oh, this is funny. People are watching it. And then in that third season, they can really break away from just being, you know, a comedy outlet and into something that I think Big Mouth 2 is also a very relevant and important show. Um, And there's so many moments on it where I'm like, oh, my God, I felt this way as a kid. And I didn't know anyone else felt this way or did this or... um, But I, I do think that has to do a lot with, like, the Netflix algorithm of, sh- of their shows and i mean another netflix show that we've talked about at length on this podcast a couple times is bojack horseman and all three of us i mean tommy i'm sure you still haven't finished it yet because that's just how you are but you know we've all watched the early seasons and i think bojack is still partially in that system of you know the first two seasons it was more so going for the hits of what it wanted and then later on it kind of streamlines into its real message and it, and it has its its portions where it really hits you hard um but another show that i think that is kind of around the same length that episode family not really a comedy but kind of followed that same suit was stranger things in the way that the first season it was it was really really good but it went for what it knew it wanted it went for 80s nostalgia it went for like tense horror and you know just kind of a good hit from the 80s and then season two kind of griped on that and then season three they're like all right we're gonna go our own way we're gonna do our whole new thing people are gonna separate so i think emily i think you are right where netflix kind of allows or kind of wants shows in its early seasons to you know kind of deliver on what they promise and then they're like all right now you've proved you've proven yourself you can now go and kind of do whatever whatever you whatever you would like to do with your show right and it's, it's interesting in comparison to another streaming source like Hulu, which there are so many um, very incredible Hulu originals like Handmaid's Tale and Harlots and The Worst of Us. And, and all of those follow such a, a different setup. And I also kind of like the way Hulu does it. They force you to watch one episode a week when those seasons come out, which helps the longevity of the show and also keeps the shows relevant for longer. Netflix fails in a lot of ways for me because, you know, they'll advertise their originals for about a month before another original is going to come out and they need to kind of switch gears and talk about that original. Like Queer Eye is big right now, but Queer Eye is not going to be big for the rest of the year after the summer. Whereas with Hulu, and of course, because of COVID, I won't see any new episodes of Handmaid's Tale, and I'm emotionally dealing with that. Um, um, but <laughs> they they make it a much bigger deal, and that makes me as a viewer excited and and want to watch. And then, of course, at the end of the season, you have all the episodes consecutively if you want to go back and and watch them consecutively. But yeah, I think that's also interesting that you bring that up when it co- when talking about Hulu, since Hulu has that channel, fi- like that channel basis where I'm going to bring up FX as the example. Um, 
you know, for some shows, they make deals with FX or, or other shows where they're like, all right, you can release on your channel on regular, you know, TV, and then the next day it'll be available on Hulu, but it'll still come out on that weekly basis. Like, for example, Dave on FX is the most recent one I can think of where the show comes out on FX on like the Thursday night and then the Friday morning it's available or even it might be that midnight. I'm not really sure. I didn't follow along that well, but that's, that's a really interesting system talking about relevancy when it comes to, you know, your project as a creator, I think it kind of then allows for a different aspect of how you want to release your content. You could go for Netflix, get a bunch of hits within a month, or you could go to Netflix and, and or you could go to Hulu and last for like eight weeks. And that's so much better. Yeah, I was about to say, I think that's an interesting question of, as a creator, do you want something to have that big hit? Or do, would you rather have something that has longevity and kind of maybe creates a cult following? Something that I've been watching recently is Community. And when it was on TV, it didn't really have that much of a following because it was right after The Office. People didn't really want to watch it as much. But as it's on Netflix, growing its legs, people are starting to watch it again. People are starting to realize, oh, this show is actually amazing. Uh, I think Hulu shows are getting that as well with being able to get that longevity as a creator yourself is that something you look for while doing your writing or anything like that instead of getting like that hit piece are you looking for something that people will read for time and time again definitely i mean it as a writer it can be a little bit difficult because there's really not a lot of opportunity for you to stretch out writing um but as you know, the owner and editor of a, an online music magazine and, and as a published writer generally, I just, I think advertisement and excitement and using social media in thoughtful ways to really like represent yourself and what you want people to be interested in is a really great way to create that longevity, to remind people like, hey, I put out this really cool playlist article the other week, like check it out again or, you know, reposting articles when they're relevant if there's you know something going on in in the world that points to the article or to the story i i will repost it so that's i think a question for most artists is how do you stay relevant how do you keep people interested and um you know with the hook i'm going through this really big rebrand right now where we're completely making over the whole website, I've gotten new logos. I have this really great staff of peers who are, um, who have been with me since the beginning of, in 2016, photographers, writers, things like that. And, and they too share those things. So it's really just about extending those like tentacles of social media and being like, hey, look at my stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's forever for all of us. I mean, Tommy and I, us being video creators and you being, you know, a literary creator, all of you, be, you have to find that avenue of extension, whether it would be social media or professional networking or, you know, branding and stuff like that. So it's definitely an, an interesting way to go about releasing your media. And I'm glad that you brought up the hook because, you know, it's a music magazine, you own it you love music. So what music have you been going over through quarantine? I mean, for all of us, music is a good escape from everyday reality. So what's, what's been your escape? Definitely. So very exciting news. Recently, I forced Sammy onto Apple music so that uh, I could good. start making her playlist. Brought her to the good side. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been really fun because a, I love making playlists playlist and B, I, I really love finding music that other people love based on, I mean, I live with her, so I know what kind of music she likes, but that's been a really fun task for me. I have to say, I haven't really been diving into too many whole albums, but I've definitely been trying to keep up with relevant music. Um, if I look right now, songs that I'm into are mostly electronic, honestly, and <laughs> Yeah, I think that's because... It runs in the family. It does. It does. And I, I just, I don't know, I like, it keeps you upbeat because of the tempo. Mm. So I've just been, I don't want to listen to sad music right now. I want to listen to inspiring music. I'm really into Caribou's latest album. 
um, which I'm blank, you and I, I think it's called, no, suddenly, it's called suddenly caribou. Um, and that's so good. They're like indie electronic, which is something mm. that I'm really into. <laughs> so that yeah, sounds like I, uh, something I'd be into as well, because I've always loved the indie scene and, uh, Chris has been nice enough to show me his electronic scene and kind of branching me out into new ways because I remember when I was younger, electronic music was like, oh, I, I don't like house music. I don't like all this type of stuff. And then Chris was nice enough to show me the things that he really enjoys. And then we sort of the bond on that. Have you two bonded through music? Oh, man. Well, that's an awesome question. It's so funny because bringing up our last week's guest, Val, just hearing him go off about pop, pop punk music. And Emily is such, is literally my influence for Panic at the Disco, Fall Out Boy, uh, you know, Sum 41, Blink 182. Like, she is the reason that I listen to alternative music as a whole, why I love Panic at the Disco so much. She was the first person that showed me Panic at the Disco. It's like, and then in as we've gotten older, I've shared a lot of electronic music with Emily. Emily loves Flume. She's the first person to send me music when Flume releases new stuff. It's... It's such a fun dynamic to have as siblings when you do have like at your core different favorite music genres, but we're able to share them and just be like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Or like, it's very like an instinctual feeling of, I think Emily would like this or Emily feels that I would like it. And it's just, it works every single time. I can't think of a time where I sent her music or she sent me music that we didn't like. Right. And we're both two people who like to just genuinely sit and listen to music without other things going on. So it's nice to, you know, when I come home or when Christopher comes up here, it's very much like we can just sit and listening to music is part of our hangout, you know, being like, oh, have you heard this one? You know, did you see this lineup for, you know, this festival or something i mean i was supposed to go to firefly this summer we were gonna go to gov ball because team impala and foals were gonna be there and they're my favorite bands in the world <laughs> um but it's fine <laughs> okay there's always next year yeah. there's always next year for firefly and for governor's ball right. with sharing music uh i feel like that's something that's really important to being the owner of the hook and everything like that is that really what made you want to start a music magazine or is there something else that really got you to that point? Yeah, I mean, so I went to the University of the Arts, which is a private art university in Philadelphia, and it's a very small select school. Um, but music is one of the biggest colleges that is part of the university. So I have a lot of friends who played, you know, in underground DIY bands and in Philly, there's this just huge DIY scene where, you know, there's shows basically every night of the week in, of any genre you want. And just like realizing that that was the first time that I felt like I could walk into a room and, you know, no one was judging me or no one was thinking badly of me. Everyone was just there for the same purpose, which was to listen to music and meet new people and network. So I started writing for my friend's blog and he wanted me just to write about labels which send out press releases. Um, but I wanted to write more about the local scene. So we kind of butt heads on that. And I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do it on my own. And that's when I started The Hook. And I had no idea it was going to become anything. I was just doing it because I genuinely love music. It inspires so much of my writing. And I felt like as a writer, I could really give back to this community that I love and cherish by writing about it and writing about the people who make it happen. You know, not only the bands, but also the people who own the venues or host the events or, you know, do the community outreach or anything. And it's, it's led to a lot of really cool things. And I've also met so many like different and exciting people who all have different goals and missions and places of where they've come from. So it's, it's really just stemmed out of the fact that I love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I even had a brief experience of being able to work alongside Emily while she was doing, you know, some early stuff with the hook hosting shows and writing, putting out album reviews and stories. And I made a video for, uh, about the hook, you know, in college. Um, 
And I, I still listen to some of the music that I found through the Hook magazine. Like, I still listen to Honey Tiger. I think they're great. But, so uh, they're so much fun. And putting that video together was was so much fun. Just being able to see this whole new, ex not explosion of music, but like a, a, an awakening of a scene that I wasn't aware of. You know, I grew up, we've grown up in New Jersey our entire life, and then you went out to Philly. And even that hour and 10 minute drive explores into this whole new venue of music. I mean, the DIY scene and the music that I heard that night, even the hip hop that I heard that night was, it was so incredible. And it was so like refreshing uh, to hear. I mean, especially growing up in New Jersey, you hear a lot of, you hear a lot of different music and you hear like hip hop and you hear rock and there's a big alternative and pop punk scene in New Jersey and even some metal. But going out into into Philly and seeing Emily coordinate with these other you know creators, it was really an interesting an interesting experience to be able to see and and I can understand why you would want to be able to write about it. Honestly, music has been something that has connected us our entire an entire life and just overall. I mean, you brought me to my first music festival, and you you're someone who always is talking about music festivals and wanting to go and wanting to see more. Uh, if, if you could, obviously with COVID and everything going on, are you someone who would be interested in seeing like an online music festival as an example, like our radio station from Seton Hall is doing, um, they're doing like a radio music festival where each hour they have one band will be playing for that hour. Is that something that you would be interested in seeing like maybe live performances or even, you know, curated through, through like a studio? Definitely. And I think the, the music scene itself is coming up with so many new and creative ways to share their music in, in the time of global pandemic. So for example, like you were saying, the, the radio is a great way to host musicians because people can just tune in and listen. And it takes a lot of the pressure off because like you don't have to show up, right? So there are some other really cool ways that I've, I've been starting to see. Some people will lend out their Instagram accounts and they'll do Instagram live for you know a regular set time and each set time is a different band and they just log into the Instagram and put it on live and and do that kind of a thing um, there are also you know just people going and making videos for themselves to promote themselves M many musicians are just coming out with new music because again they have so much time on their hands um, but yeah, I mean, I I would I would even love to go to a drive-in concert, which is something some big music people are talking about. Because we still need to consume art, we still need to hear music, we still need to you know support artists, and we can be creative and find those ways to to do that. And a lot of it is actually easier and less expensive than, you know, going to a concert or a festival. So, yeah, I mean, bringing up the, the drive in concerts, I mean, one one in particular, I know a musician I follow on Twitter, Mark uh, Rebier, who is uh, uh, like a jazz keyboardist who does like really over the top music. He, he was the first person I saw who's currently doing like a drive in concert series. And that just seems that's so innovative and it's so smart and especially to go back to a system like drive-in system like for movies we talked about it a couple weeks ago I mean would that be something that you're interested in in participating in going to drive-in movies and stuff like that yeah I mean I already wanted to go to drive-in movies before COVID <laughs> so. <laughs> take my money <laughs> yeah honestly well I mean there's there's a lot of big as quarantine is quote unquote winding down it's we're kind of reaching this like middle point but you know businesses are now trying to rethink of how everything and a pretty big announcement came out from amc as a company where they're going to be reopening their movie theaters and not requiring face coverings which as a whole just doesn't seem like a smart idea and as as a avid movie gover i mean tommy i would want to hear your opinion on this too it just it just doesn't seem smart because movie theaters are already not a super clean place and not super yeah. preventative of of germs so just doesn't seem smart i think from my perspective it, it's if you're willing to go out to the movies I, I know they're uh doubling down on social distancing and everything like that but if i were to still go to the movies i would still bring a mask um 
I think that's on us to kind of do. Uh, they could enforce it. I, I think they should enforce it. But um, as a movie goer, you should be protecting yourself, protecting others, and still enjoying the community experience that you get with going to a movie theater and everything like that. And I think it's important right now to get back into that community experience because everybody everybody being isolated, it's, it's tough to keep sanity and, and everything like that because hanging out with friends, hanging out with people that have similar interests as you, it, it's something that's important for your mental health and everything like that as well. So I think if you're going to go to the movies as AMC, AMC theaters open up, you should take that precaution and still put on a mask and still enjoy that community experience that you could still get at a drive through, uh, drive in or anything like that. But I know people enjoy going to the movie theater and getting concessions and all that fun stuff. So I, I'd be going to AMC movie theaters. I know my brother has a pass and everything. So we're going to try to see as many movies as possible. But um, I think that's a really interesting question for sure. Yeah, I mean, overall, it's just it's been interesting to be able to do this podcast and kind of go along with how things change. You know, we've been able to see, you know, video on demand for movie releases. We've been able to see, you know, free releases for music based on social events going on, you know, with like run the jewels releasing their album for free. And, um, you know, it's just, there has been this wild entanglement of a whole bunch of different events that have kind of really affected the media industry. I mean, we all work in, or would like to work in different areas of media, me being in, in TV, Tommy, you want to go in film, Emily, you're a writer and you work in the music scene. We all get to see these really interesting different de decisions that the media industry makes depending on their avenue. I think um, Emily hit on a really good point earlier that art is something that has to be consumed and it's something that we crave to consume. And I would like to hear some of your favorite uh, either performances, concerts, uh, festivals that you've gone to that you went, you had this nice community experience and you just really enjoyed the music, you enjoyed the atmosphere. W what's something that's really stuck out to you over your years of going to concerts? Definitely. Um... I'll bring up three levels of concerts. My most favorite memory of a, a DIY like house show is the Hook's very first house show. And a hundred people came to this house show, which was incredible. And it was just so cool to see not only these people coming out and supporting this little magazine that I had created, but like making new friends and all of these people from different worlds of my life, just meeting and talking and, and networking and now you know, so many of them work together or play multiple shows together. And that was, that was really what solidified my love for um, underground music. As for a standalone concert, I would have to say Childish Gambino at Wells Fargo in Philadelphia was the most incredible concert I've ever seen. I mean, the energy in that place, we got to move up even closer because it was very close to the New York date. So not a lot of people came out to Philly because he's mm -hmm. playing Madison Square Garden. So we would want to go to Madison Square Garden. Um, and it was just like incredible how much like power he had over the crowd. Like they just, they were along for the ride the entire time. And it was so, so good. Um, and then for festival experience, I would have to say my very first Firefly was my most favorite because that was the first time I saw Tame Impala live. And it was just, it was like nothing I'd ever felt before. You just were in this big sweaty crowd of people and Tame Impala was on this huge stage and just playing their music. And it, it was like, everyone knew the, the words, everyone would, was moving with with the sound of it and I also saw oh god I saw so many you know what all of Firefly is blurring together for me but a lot of my favorite concerts are also from Firefly like The Killers, Glass Animals, um, ironically enough we saw Eminem one year. That's awesome. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, the the year after I had gone with you, you got to see a pretty incredible like main stage lineup. You got to see Eminem, you got to see Kendrick Lamar. Oh yeah, the Kendrick. Killers were there. Uh, there was another bigger one that year that I can't really remember. But the year that we went was was even like just a really weird but awesome main stage. Like the weekend was there, Chance yeah. the Rapper was there, Bob Dylan and his band were there. That was such a weird that was so a weird old. experience. But it was so <laughs> it was so cool to be able to say you got to see Bob Dylan and mm-hmm. like Weezer was there the one day. Muse, right, Weezer. Uh, Flume. Flume was there that Friday. Benny night. Benassi. Benny Benassi was there. It's just, just <laughs> such a wild, wild experience. Like I'm hoping I can convince Tommy to come along next year to Firefly because it is just an amazing, an amazing experience for, like you said, that like my most favorite, I'm kind of hijacking this question, but my favorite experience ever is, is Flume at Firefly. The first time I had ever seen Flume live. And I felt like it was just an out of body experience. Like I was part of this large group of people who were just experiencing this so, like such powerful electronic music that I was just like taken aback by it it's it's still I get chills thinking about it it's like easily one of my favorite memories of all time was he in the pavilion no he was on the backyard firefly had this super cool stage for electronic music called the pavilion and it was like this big tent and they decorated it with the craziest like giant like glowing balls just hanging from the ceiling and it was like insane because from the front of the pavilion all the way to like at least 50 feet onto the grass behind the pavilion and the tent itself people were standing like sardines packed together it was it's my favorite stage and they got rid of it travesty of course (laughs) it's just how things work honestly um a question I have for both of you guys, I think, would be within the DIY scene, within just an overall concert perspective, would you rather have someone like a weekend, which is purely a singer and not much a performer, or you have Flume, where it's this giant show of a DJ just playing their music, or would you have someone like a Bruno Mars that could do a, a little bit of everything? Is there something that you have a preference for or you really look for when going into a concert? I don't don't think so. I think what makes a good concert is if the performer feels confident. Um, For example, at Firefly, I saw Kesha, and this was before her lawsuit. um, So she was unable to play any new music, which means all of the, the, the music she did perform was, you know, almost 10 years old Mm -hmm. at the time. Um, But it didn't matter because Kesha is an amazing performer. Like she m- made the crowd feel included and every, because everyone knew those songs because they are older, like it was very easy for her to really play on, on those tropes of her music, which are very, you know, feminist and pop and, you know, power to women and stuff like that. And that definitely was how she performed. And then, of course, The weekend had a much different performance. He performed the same night as Kesha. He's by himself. But the stage was, like, a whole moving part. I mean, there were giant moving, like, cages that were rotating, and there's lights. So I don't think it really matters how many people there are. But if the performer loves what they're doing, is happy to be there and really like wants to put on a show is what makes the experience really good. Yeah. I think as like a a reference, it kind of dictates when you're, when you're going to a live performance, I have been to nowhere near as many as Emily has, but in the, in the experience I have, you there's sometimes you go to a performance and you want to just hear the music and you want to hear what it's like live. And then there's other times where you want to see a performance, you know, and at Firefly, I think you go in with the, understanding of well I would like to hear the music live but you're also in this whole different setting you know so like Flume was a performance it had light shows it had you know giant massive speakers it had cannons shooting out like confetti and glow sticks were being thrown around like it was a whole it was an experience from from an audience standpoint and then um you know two summers ago I went and saw Panic at the Disco at 
Madison Square Garden, and I was going specifically just to hear Panic at the Disco. Like I honestly, I could have sat in in the giant open Madison Square Garden and just heard them sing, and I would have been completely content. But I was blown away at the performance that they put on, and Brendan Urie alone. Like I love him for his vocal ability and his you know his confidence in the music that he puts out and the show they put on was just incredible like they had this huge stage they were running around there was fireworks it was it was so much fun and I think that's what makes a good concert is if you go in expecting one thing or the other and you end up getting both that's when you know you've had a good a good experience you know it's I think that's what you kind of aim for when you go to a live performance. To transition off of that point, we've been talking about music a lot, and I know both of you really love your video games. Uh, during this three-month quarantine that we've been in, what video games have you been playing? Yep, it's video game central over here. <laughs> I'm, I would like to really touch on the fact that we went out and bought a PS2 specifically so uh, we could play DVR. <laughs> Perfect. That's exactly what I want to hear. <laughs> um, I love DDR, <laughs> and so it was very worth the purchase. We also got Guitar Hero. Um, one of the one best games ever. Two. Yeah. Right. So that that's fun. I've also been playing Animal Crossing, which has really lost its luster for me. Um, well, when you do everything, it kind of loses its luster. <laughs> it's it's not even that. It's it's more so that the the game just doesn't update enough. Like. Mm there aren't enough new things every month to kind of really keep it going. And while there are weekly things, those weekly things are the same every week. They happen on the same day. Um, you know, buying turnips on Sunday and on Tuesday, the bug catcher's there or the weed person is there. And it's, it's, it's a fun game at first. And they do this thing where you have to play according to the, the day, like you're playing like real time real time hmm. and that helps the longevity of the game but then begins to hurt it because then you're like well now what am I supposed to do so I've been playing a ton of Assassin's Creed Odyssey on Xbox um I loved Assassin's Creed you know with Ezio but it really lost its its luster in that weird middle era of it existing because they just never changed up the format of how the game is played. <clears throat> so, you know, in Assassin's Creed, you play as an assassin. It takes place in, in very historically correct maps. Um, the first game's taking place, you know, in Italy and um, the, the colonies. And, you know, now Odyssey takes place in Greece. Um, you can play as a woman, which is... <laughs> incredible um and not only is Cassandra a badass she also is a queer queen because in Gre Grecian culture um sexuality was very fluid and I really love that they represented that in the game um but it's super hard it's huge like the biggest map I've ever seen and I'm really enjoying it because it is such a challenge. The only other game that really challenges me is um, Red Dead. And I love Red Dead. <laughs> I am at 94% for Red Dead 2. For total completion? So, yeah. That's crazy to me. Yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> like, I mean, over, yeah, I've Tommy been watched... Like 70 hours. See, that's, that's wild. That's Tommy watched me play the first two missions, like, when the game released at midnight. Yeah back when we were living together and the fact that you have I think in my first completion of the game I got tired of it at like 82 percent completion the fact that you have 94 percent total completion is just insane to me because the challenges in that game alone are so hard I don't know how you do them I don't know, like I give Dedication. you so much credit for the fact that you've made it that far it's <laughs> such a hard game yeah I mean not only is Red Dead an amazing story, which is one of the biggest things that I lo like about the original game and also Rockstar as a gaming company, but they really do 
and have expanded the game so much that, you know, there are so many very small challenges that are like very hard. Right now I'm tr trying to uh, work on my horsemanship and I'm stuck on the very last leg of it where you have to ride from An Annisburg to Blackwater in, I want to say 14 minutes and you can't touch any water. Ugh. <laughs> 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 and it is it is the current bane of my existence because I've even looked up, you know, tutorials on on good routes to take. And I, of course, have, you know, a very fast and legendary Arabian who is broken all the way through. So I'm not really sure why I'm not getting it. Um, but then, you know, even if I tried to move on to other things, it's still like I'm at the just the hardest of the hard at 94 percent and i want to beat it so bad because i want to start it over and play it again <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh that's one of the things i did not during uh, not like i didn't start it during quarantine but i really picked it back up during quarantine was my second playthrough of red dead and i was like i'm just going to do every side mission i come across before i'll even choose to do the main story and i was doing those challenges through through it and i think the only time i completed a challenge like grouping was I completed the gambling uh, challenges and that's because frankly once you understand how to play the games they're pretty easy to do mm -hmm. but the last one is so luck based it's like in blackjack you have to get like blackjack three times without losing any money or something like that it's just a nightmare of a luck scenario and it's just i give you so much credit for completing even half of those challenges because they're so <laughs> damn hard they're so damn yeah hard. but um i've also been playing call of duty um world war ii which i prefer over modern warfare mm -hmm. um, modern, nah. modern warfare to me the maps are too intricate and there's like too many hidey holes if that makes sense like it gives me a headache to play it's online yeah exactly and i it's it becomes a nuisance whereas uh world war Two, the maps are they remind me a lot of world at war um they're pretty straightforward you know you can really go along the outskirts of the maps and and still do really well without having to get into a lot of like the bunker scenarios or the hidey holes and stuff like that i haven't played that in a while the only other game that i'm really really playing is sims 4 um and i got the pets expansion and the tiny home expansion Perfect. and <laughs> it's so fun you can have puppies and kittens like, <laughs> and, like i've never can... played sims oh, oh my gosh good <laughs> emily and i grew up playing what was it sims 2 on the gamecube was yep. the Sims that we owned because we didn't have like a, a we had a family computer but it wasn't capable of running Sims mm -hmm. so we played Sims 2 on GameCube I think we we created like at least 20 new games just just <laughs> to, just to play Sims is so much it's so much like free time fun because you could literally do whatever whatever you want mm -hmm. yeah and there's different like any other video game, there's, you know, your Sims have aspirations, they have goals, you do get certain things if your Sims achieve their goals. I mean, I, of course, love to hack it and give myself tons of money because my favorite part of the game is building the house. <laughs> Usually I get bored after that. <laughs> but I have two families right now who I'm, I'm really working on. And one family, I'm on like the third generation of them. Wow. And the other one just adopted a son. So well, that's wow. nice of you. Very nice. <laughs> Real humanitarian over here. <laughs> I'm doing the work. Really doing God's it. work on Sims. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, it's nice what, you... have, uh, what have you been playing? Uh, uh, still a lot of MLB The Show. It's still eating at my core every five seconds I play. It's defeating you every day. Yeah, uh, I've, I've been trying Warzone a little bit more. We've been playing together here and there. Uh, hopefully we'll do that more and more as free time opens up. I mean, with all of this going on, it's 
actually consuming a decent amount of time. But uh, getting to play with you, getting to play with someone that actually knows what they're doing, because I am trash at first person so shooter games. So funny playing Warzone with you. <laughs> I'm just a call out guy. It was like when I used to play Fortnite. I was just like the medic. I was just, I'm the support character. I know my role. <laughs> I, I let the good people do their good stuff. <laughs> no, it's been like from Emily, from the examples of like me and Tommy playing, we've played like maybe I think 10 times or 10 matches. And every time Tommy is like the first one to say, uh, guy 240 Northwest, uh, make sure you go over there and uh, just watch out. Oh, so here's an M14 with seven bullets. Uh, take that. Uh, so <laughs> it's just like, he's just always saying something that's going on. It's, it's a lot of fun to play with them, but never stops talking i feel like i'd be a good uh dungeon master in dungeons and dragons or something like trying to explain the lore and everything because i i feel like i'm better explaining things than actually playing the game at whatever it is <laughs> <laughs> i would love to see you as a dm but i, yeah. play, I played a lot of call of duty with emily and, yeah. and her boyfriend ryan and like Emily said, she doesn't like modern warfare, so I go back and play World War World War Two with them. Mm-hmm. And it is just so funny watching Emily play because she is so good with the weirdest weapons. <laughs> like she runs around, I can't remember which which submachine gun it is, but she'll just run around with a submachine gun and just tear through people. Meanwhile, I'm trying to follow up behind her, like make sure nobody is attacking, and I'll just get shot in the back every three seconds. But Emily's like, I got this. I'm taking out everyone in front of me. <laughs> Here's all my kill streaks. Take them. And I'm like, that's awesome. Oh my god. Yeah, it's funny too because, um, as a as a woman in gaming, it it can be hard to find people to game with who take you seriously. I mean, there are unfortunately a lot of people who, you know, they're like, oh, it's cute. You play video games, like, um you know, let's play together. And then I kick their ass and they're like, so upset. So it's really funny now because my boyfriend, like every week, he brings all of his Xbox, his TV out into the living room because that's Mm -hmm. where my Xbox is. And he's like, isn't it so cool that we get to just sit next to each other and play? Isn't it? Isn't it? And I'm like, we're literally trying to play right now. Like, just play the game and it's just so funny (laughs) because he he doesn't make me feel like you know i'm an outsider in this very exclusive gaming community it's like i'm beating him most of the time and like he's just using that as incentive to be like i'm gonna get better and what the like (laughs) so that's fun yeah it's a nice competition part of it and i i mean i wish i were good at video games i grew up with two older siblings that just dominated me at all points but it's really nice to hear that you two played together and kind of have that fun with each other of you just want each other to do well uh, like for for my family it's like you're just going to get obliterated and like i'm going to make fun of you for it but it seems like you have a nice chemistry together when you guys are playing uh yeah i mean we've never really been super competitive when it comes to video games the only time i can ever think of emily and i being competitive while playing games was back when we would play gamecube like locally and we would either play smash together and emily would get really tired of that really quickly because she would either beat me really fast or it would just be like a really drawn out fight where she get tired of it or we would play kirby air ride and we would just race all the time and it was even the entire time so it's yeah, it's God, good. Yeah. It's good. It's good to grow up and have siblings where you can like share. Also, like our parents made sure that Emily had to share the the, the game system. <laughs> you had like to that. share the GameCube, not me. Yeah, well, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but even at that point, after like when, uh, you know, when we had moved on to the next consoles, and I got my first 360, like Emily played on that as well, and she was able to play. You know, she had her own profile, and she would play World of War and do good at that and then we would try and play games together and she would get so annoyed at me when I would ask her to play Halo 3 for like the 700th time and so yeah it's definitely it's definitely definitely good to have a sibling and also playing games like with Emily before she had like a boyfriend when we were both younger and like being Mm -hmm. in online lobbies and just hearing how you know guys would treat her or talk to her like in multiplayer lobbies it kind of shows you how to not be a a a-hole in multiplayer and like it's just just good etiquette so that's 
another good thing of part of the process of everything. Of course. Yeah, and I was super lucky too to have a brother who was so supportive of me playing video games and who wanted me to play with him and like wanted me to see what was going on and made me feel interested in in video game culture and then too made me confident in those lobbies because I mean when we started playing on Xbox 360 it was still the time of there were very few women who played and it was still the time of you would talk in the lobby. I mean, you talk to everyone in there and mm -hmm. I often would either get made fun of or I remember this one experience in Red Dead where I was actually with a group of friends. I had this really little group of like people I played with and I just started getting like people just started surrounding me in the game and just killing me over and over and over and like they would find where I would spawn and like four of them would rush up on me and just like constantly kill me and it's like that's that doesn't make the game fun like I'm at the time I mean in the original Red Dead like I was gold I had gold weapons like I was one of the best players and I still would get treated like I wasn't good because they would hear that I was a girl over the mic which was not cool yeah, yeah it's it's tough whole... to hear especially at that time when i mean 360 lobbies were not nice to anyone but it's, it's especially worse for a female trying to play and i'm glad you've stuck with it and you're, you're continuing to get better you're continuing to prove that you're a part of this culture and everything like that i think that's really nice to hear um i know the ps5 just got announced and you guys are seems to be xbox people uh, did you guys watch the release? Did you, are you guys excited for it in any way? Are you excited to hear about the pricing for the new Xbox as well? Because I know they're both holding off until one breaks and then the other one's going to go lower. So, I was mainly excited to see, this is gonna, where it gets kind of nerdy, but I was really excited to see like the hardware portion of PS5. I wanted to see how it compared to the Xbox One X series or the mm -hmm. Xbox whatever the fuck it's called now. Um I, I mean, they, they're, they're pretty close to when it comes hardware, mm -hmm. which is exciting. I mean, I, I like the, the state of which, like, gaming consoles are going. It's making it more inclusive for people who can't afford, like, a PC that want to have that power and that capability of playing. I, mainly, PS5 just has so many cool exclusives, and it just sucks to be an Xbox player and so not great. be able to play Amazing Spider-Man or not be able to play God of War or like the fact that they get all of these bonus exclusives for Call of Duty that come out like months before. So I don't know, it's exciting, but it also kind of stinks as a player who just genuinely enjoys games. Yeah. And I mean, PS5 did announce that they're, the, the PS5 is going to be close to $800. I mean, and that's, that alone is, is going to hurt them because that's insane. $800 for a console is just pure insanity. Mm -hmm. And I'll be interested to see what the Xbox does. But at the same time, I actually was having this conversation with Ryan the other day um, that, you know, I don't understand the need to come up with a new console every couple of years. Like, give these consoles longevity. Give these electronics longevity because people will play them. You know, people will even buy a second one if, if it something happens within you know a few years of having it so for me I feel a bit wishy-washy about it I, I don't really care I mean the new PS5 looks cool and it is true there are you know a bunch of games that you can't play um because they're PS5 exclusive and I had a PS2 and I enjoy using a PlayStation, but I'm not going to go out and spend $800 on a PS5. Um, but I also wouldn't go out and, I mean, probably spend similar money for the new Xbox. Mm. I think as a whole, it's just kind of, and this goes with all, all forms of technology, but as we've progressed, you know, technology wise, the, the lifespan of each generation of console just gets shorter by like two years each time. I mean, the Xbox 360 came out in I want to say like 2006 around that time Sounds about and then and then the xbox one came out in 2014 so that's eight years 
And then, you know, 2014 to 2020 or 2021, technically holiday, uh, that's seven, six to seven years for the next generation of console for that. You know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate, but I agree with that. Like, it sucks that you have each, each less than a decade. You sh if you really care, you shell out over $500 for this new console. If you want to be able to play state of the art games and stuff like that for a medium that in all honesty, like compared to other media that is equal to it, whether it's movies or television or music, like you don't spend unless, I don't know, unless you're a really like avid film fan that spends like a bunch of money on like a projector and upgrades your home theater and stuff like that, then it could probably be super expensive or a, a, a music lover who spends a bunch of money on like either vinyl records or like professional studio equipment, like with speakers and, and headphones and stuff like that. But it just feels like, so much money goes into enjoying the hobby where it kind of then almost hurts your desire to really want to keep up with it. Yeah, I get that. Uh, from a other perspective, I think it's, it's interesting to see where the technology is going. Um, Cause obviously PC gaming is the best. It's the smoothest. It's the cleanest. It looks the nicest, everything like that. And I think consoles are trying to get up to that, standard and it's cool to see the new technology that they're bringing out but i totally agree that eight hundred dollars is unfathomable to a recent college grad or even someone in college like to their target demographic it's it's unbelievably expensive and trying to obtain that for a kid or for a young adult whatever it may be that's tough to do i mean it's nice to get all these nice games and everything like that and see the new features that come out but like you guys are saying it, it's it's nearly impossible at a certain point right and that's the you bring up an interesting point by saying like their their demographic are millennials and gen z like young people playing video games who have grown up playing video games who want to spend the money on that i mean even even more relaxed players people who have Nintendo Switches, like a Switch is $300 for, mm -hmm. for the detachable one and, and a light is $200. And, you know, I mean, currently the Switch is completely sold out, but it even takes away the fact that a lot of, a lot of these people would maybe possibly receive the console as a gift for a birthday or Christmas. I mean, $800 is, is much more than a lot of families are even willing to spend you know, buying gifts for someone. So it it's becoming very exclusive, and I think it's a dangerous way to go when game consoles want to be like PC. You can build your own PC for much cheaper than that and, and play, you know, on Steam so many games for so much less than that. Plus, the cost of these games is $60 a pop, like if it's yeah. a, a name brand game. So, I mean, you're going to be spending $1,000 on a new PS5. So that's just, it's hard because as a gamer, you want, you want that stuff. You want to be the best technology, the best games, um, but it's just becoming, you know, unaffordable. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely rough all around. And then like also hearing this discussion right now, I also kind of want to take the viewpoint of like, as a person who, you know, enjoys art and wants to support art in all forms, like you kind of grapple with yourself of like, yeah, it's a lot of money, but like, I also want them to keep creating it, you know, like you don't want to not support the industry so that, you know, things like what we enjoy go away because they're, we feel like we're getting priced out. Like you kind of want to find this middle ground of, I, I'm willing to pay, but I don't want to break my bank in one week just because I wanted to get a new console, you know, but it's, it's, I agree. It's tough. It's tough overall. I'll be interested to see where the Xbox prices itself, where, you know, what deals are made when it comes to exclusives for, you know, like Call of Duty always makes an exclusive every year, like an exclusive deal with PlayStation. And then there's like the Halo games for Xbox and stuff and Microsoft and Minecraft and stuff like that. So It'll be interesting, but I think that's a good amount of video game talk. We've kind of gone at length at that. I mean, Emily, I kind of wanted to go back to your writing because, you know, you really bring in a whole new aspect of 
media that we haven't really had the opportunity to talk to a lot of other people about and it's writing and, and you have a lot of experience in it and Tommy and I both have a good amount of questions for you I mean we know that you went to UArts for creative writing you're currently getting your master's uh, in fine arts where creative writing and education where where has your experience kind of taken you what are, like what examples of writing do you have and you know who do you who do you like reading the most of or want to write like definitely it's a loaded question yeah it's a lot of questions at once sorry it's okay i'll just start at the very beginning with when i was a kid i really liked to tell stories um i had stories about everything my mom our mom <laughs> she's just my mom she's just <laughs> okay no. for this podcast she can just be your mom <laughs> Our mom um, tells me, you know, about how when I was little, I would make up stories about ghosts and and horses and all of the little things I was interested in. And as a kid, I had notebooks just full of these stories. And I, before I could write, I would draw. And then once I was able to write, I would fill entire notebooks with these just stories I came up with. Um, and all throughout, you know, growing up, I wasn't, I never had anything that really sparked my interest. Like some people really have careers in mind for what they want to do. And they know that from a very young age. All I knew was that I really liked to tell people stories and, you know, maybe I could go into English or something. And it wasn't until community college uh, that I really discovered, like, there is opportunity for this if I really want to work for it. And as I've said to many people, um, art is something that if you truly love it, you know, it is going to be the hardest work of your whole entire life. There is no defined entrance. There is no time in which you're supposed to enter it. Um, it really is just the right place, the right time. So that's when I went to UArts. A friend actually said to me, hey, they're they're adding a creative writing program, you know, you should apply. So I applied to three colleges, two of which were English and teaching, one of which were creative writing. And when I got to UArts, A, it was like, wow, I, you know, all of these other artists, like I feel so inspired and like I'm at home. Um, but it also really pushed my writing because as a young writer, you don't really think about you know, story and arc and climax and character development and, and all of that stuff. And you start to learn those things and you learn that not only by writing and workshop, but, but especially by reading um, and consuming media like television or movies, because even all media is a story. It takes place in a story, except maybe music sometimes. So there's, stories being told all around us and you can really kind of pick and choose like what stories matter to you and what stories inspire you and and show you how to do something you've never done before um so i i started out writing psychological thrillers and horror um which is something that i still really enjoy <clears throat> but being in grad school a lot of contemporary fiction to be considered literary, it usually has to be realistic. And um, that's been something that is hard that I've been dealing with at Emerson because I, I want to be a better writer within the genres that I really enjoy, which is horror, psychological thrillers, um, magical realism and stuff like that, where you know something about the world is slightly askew because I think something about the world is slightly askew all the time. Um, but I will say that Emerson is the hardest and most rewarding experience of my writing career thus far, because it is hard to sit in a classroom of peers who are so talented. I mean, Emerson is a very hard school to get into and it, it it can be overwhelming. It can it can feel like, oh my God, I don't belong here. I'm not a good writer. And, and there are definitely workshop experiences that I have had that, you know, people just say straight to your face, like this sucks. 
Like this has nothing going for it. But then there are also those workshop experiences where, you know, the biggest compliment in, in grad school is like, I think one more edit of this and it'll be ready to publish. Like that's such a exciting and uplifting thing to hear because being in grad school is, is about focusing on your art and being the best it can be. Taking everything that you've learned and really cultivating it into something like super specific, um, which has been good. I mean, I originally was going for education. Unfortunately, I was not selected to be a teaching assistant at Emerson because of COVID. Um, they just were not hiring. And that, that was hard because it was, it was a big reason I chose the school. Um, but I've decided to switch my focus to, you know, writing, submitting my work to contests within the literary world and, you know, hoping to get feedback, hoping to just place. I've been published a handful of times, not on my own magazine, but uh, other literary magazines, the most recent being the Roadrunner Review. Um, my flash fiction piece, When Threatened, was published in the winter, I believe January or February, and they nominated it for a Pushcart Prize, which is um, a prize for like tiny press. So that was exciting and it's, it's definitely a journey and as an artist, I've had to really learn to kind of like suck it up sometimes and just be like, okay, this didn't work. Like, how can we come at it in a different way? And it is a lot of writing and just being like, okay, someone else read this. Is it working? What are your questions? Um, and sometimes you really come out with something spectacular. Like I have two stories right now that did so well this year in workshop, but then I had also four stories that did like just absolutely tanked. So it's, it's been a wild ride. I am excited for two months off. This is my last week of summer classes. I've been doing it entirely on Zoom um, since about March. And I am excited to keep moving forward. Also excited to be able to read when we talk about um, authors that I'm really into. It's kind of hard to say. I'm just, I'm reading like five books right now at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Because I'm just like, oh, I got to read all these books. I gotta... yeah. <laughs> Cause that's the other thing about grad school is everyone is very well read. Like mm -hmm. classics and contemporary uh, literature combined. Very well read. I mean, that's really nice to hear. I, I know, I mean, we're all part of the conglomerate of art. So we, we understand how hard it is, like you're saying. And there are moments where you're just like, am I enough for this and all that stuff. We're always looking for validation. But um, I think the thing is just to keep going with it and keep working at your craft, finding your voice and everything like that. I'd be very excited to read your stuff. Uh, I've always liked the suspense thriller type genre of both movie and um, reading. Um, so you said you're, you're reading a lot right now. Who in the past has really influenced you or someone that you, you want to emulate in your career or really get to find your voice like they did? Right. Um, obviously, I've said for many years, Christopher knows that I want to be the next Stephen King, except better and also a girl. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean Stephen King's novels because Stephen King is very long-winded um, mm -hmm. but he has incredible collections of short stories which really like hone in on how good he is at what he does I mean the sheer suspense of his writing is something that it really inspires me uh, another writer who does a similar thing is Joyce Carol Oates um Again, I'm talking specifically about her short story collections, like The Dollhouse. Um, I mean, they're very, very talented writers and interesting people. If I were to say more recent writers, I would probably go with Karen Russell, who is considered one of the best um, contemporary writers of magical real realism currently. Um, 
but I also, I read a lot of like short story collections, you know, America's best short stories of so-and-so. And and that's, that's where I, I really enjoy because those collections are so full of different stories. Yeah. It's nice to be able to, you know, read horror and psychological thrillers, but there is a realness to those stories. And I think reading realistic fiction helps understand that realness and you know that the things that make people scared or the things that make people feel anxious are real things and that having real characters in real problem situations is enough to to be scary sometimes if that makes sense and I hope I answered the question yeah you did you definitely did uh that kind of goes into what we talked about last week of the the realness of horror and everything and I think uh it's different seasons, I believe Stephen King wrote, and it's it's about uh, I believe that's Stand by Me and uh, Shawshank Redemption and all those movies we come to love. Um, my girlfriend's reading that; she loves those short stories and everything. But like you're saying, it, it's something that's grounded in reality. It's something that we could all relate to, and I think um, it's really nice to get those original stories from Stephen King, and then also seeing the adaptations going into film or going into TV and things like that. Um, so that's really nice to hear. What else has writing done for you? I I know it's both creative writing and writing for a magazine. Is there something you prefer more? Is there something that you'd rather go into? I mean, I would love to be a a freelance writer, an author, you know, (laughs) I want people to buy my books. I want my job to be going to readings and stuff like that. Um, but if I could have a career in music journalism, I, I also would feel very fulfilled in that way, too. Thank you, Emily, so much for coming on to the show. It's been nice to meet you. It's been nice to hear about you. Um, thank you, Chris, for conducting this interview. I think this came out really well. Thank you for watching. And please like and subscribe. And we'll catch you next time.